see you. Come on in and make yourself at home. Good morning. Here, you can take, oh, I guess you don't need one of these. How about you grab a cup of coffee instead? Vancouver United Church for the week of November 15th. I'm Katie Nofsiger, and I'm so happy to be here this morning. Uh, we're here with uh, Jerry Van Wyck, our music and minister, and our two very talented soloists, Sophie and Tristan. Good morning, Katie. Good morning, Sam. How are you this morning? Great. Yeah, how was the drive across the bridge? It was like driving at midnight. There was no one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Reverend Simon Lassier, and uh, welcome, to, welcome to our gathering today. And a big thank you to Kim Logan and Takahiro Mori who are helping us and our words uh, get to you wherever you are this morning. And thanks to Brian too who I know does a lot of work uh, after the service in making sure that the services are available online. And this morning your Facebook host is Mimi Toma so you can uh, give her a like and uh, a, a wave or something like that. Um, we have a really special guest this morning, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, why Rabbi Philip later. And, uh, but I want, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a sense. Um, so Rabbi Philip will be sharing with us this morning a little bit about what Sabbath is, is all about. And 
This is part of our Back to Basics series, and we'll, we'll be touching a little bit on that a little bit later. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rabbi Gibbs had a family emergency that required him to travel to the, U- the U.S., uh, which we all know means two weeks of quarantine when uh, on his return. And so he was unable to be here with us in person, but uh, we're going to try something new. And so we worked with him to, to uh, put together a three-part sermon. And I'm actually really excited about it. Katie and I got to watch it and engage with it. And, um, and I hope that it gives you a vision for what it means to rest and to be present with those around you. Um, yeah. Yeah, as Simon mentioned, it's part of our ongoing uh, Foundations of Faith series. And so I know for a lot of us, Sabbath is something that either had frigid, strict rules around it, or maybe it's something that is new to us that we haven't paid attention to at all, or that it's kind of part of the olden days where we couldn't go to a restaurant on a Sunday. So um, before we move to lighting the Christ candle, I just want to pass on some, uh, just some, some, sad, some sad news. Um, I want to just inform you and let you know of the passing of Margie Humphreys, uh, Margie McEwen, and um, she passed away a few weeks ago, and the, the family has been very open um, with, uh, with her passing that was sudden and unexpected after a long battle with uh, mental health. And so if you can hold them in your prayers, um, I know Margie was an important part of this congregation, was, was very involved in, in, in many different ways. And um, I also want to let you know of the passing of John Gillies, who died this week. And uh, John passed away on his 99th birthday. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, we also hold uh, his family in prayer. Every week we light the Christ candle to remind us of Christ's presence in the world. And so I'd love to invite Glenn Ives to do that. But before he does that, he is uh, sharing some exciting news for next week. (laughs) Thank you, Katie. It's not often the treasurer gets a... told that he's giving exciting news, Uh, but in this case it may be true. Uh, Good morning. I last spoke to you in September when we launched our special COVID-19 financial appeal. Today, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for believing in our mission. In September, when I spoke, we were projecting a deficit in our general fund of $243,000. With your help and a little bit of financial assistance from the government, we, have now, we are now able to reduce our projection to $144,000. Thank you so much for your support. Now, I have faith over this last two months of the year that we will continue to reduce the projected deficit through your givings and also the new government programs that were announced in October. If you want all the details, all the exciting details uh, that Katie talked about, you can read my treasurer's report that was contained in this week's emails. Now, like Katie, I am so excited about what our church is doing to fulfill its mission, particularly during this pandemic. I would say we've risen to the occasion, whether it's through the youth ministry and the youth group meetings, the UCW and their continually staying in contact, the caring ministry, the Stephen ministry, the support of those in our community who need us, We are indeed walking the Christian talk. I see exciting activities all over the place, whether it's the renewal of the flea market in a different form, the decoration of our church to make sure the community knows that we are still celebrating Christ's birth in December. 
These are all signs of a vibrant Christian community, and it's all thanks to your support. Next Sunday is Consecration Sunday. That is the, this is the Sunday that we ask you to consider the question, what is God calling me to give to the mission of West Vancouver United Church? Now this week in the mail, you'll receive a pledge card and uh, 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 some instructions. We hope you'll complete your pledge card during the service next week and get it to the church, whether you drop it off or deliver it in, in by, uh, by mail. Uh, there is an online opportunity this year. If you would like, you'll be able to complete your pledge card online. So we are moving with the times. Now, I'd like to share one final story of how we are fulfilling our mission. As you know, we have sponsored a number of refugee families from Syria over the last few years. A few weeks ago, in the middle of the pandemic, we received a call from the government asking if we were ready to receive six refugees within 14 days. John Mendez and the Refugee Committee thought about it for a nanosecond and said yes. Then they got really, really, really busy and indeed welcomed those refugees. Now, as you watch this video, please contemplate the question, what is God calling me to give to support the mission of our church? Thank you. yourself right now, I invite you to take a deep breath and set our hearts and minds on God's presence and goodness. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Good and gracious God, we gather today to pause, to rest, to sing, to pray, all of this as an act of worship. Set us apart, Lord, for all that you call us to stand for in this world. Set us apart that together we might embody a different way, a different rhythm. Help us clear the clutter and frenzy that busy our minds, that we might hear you more clearly. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Allow us to enter your Sabbath rest, 
as your Sabbath rest enters into us. In the name of our Creator, our Liberator, our resurrection and life, we pray. God, we also give thanks for the lives of Margie Humphreys and John Gillies. May you be close to their families and walk alongside them through their grief. Amen. excited this morning or today to introduce our special guest for our scripture reading. Now in 2012, a group of about 40 or 45 of us from West Vancouver United Church went on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land in Israel. And there we met a man named Shimon who was larger than life. And Shimon uh, was our tour guide who showed us around he even played a part in helping me find in Jerusalem uh, what would eventually become the engagement ring with which I had proposed uh, to Megan. And um, I hadn't talked to him in, in several years. And when I was thinking about Sabbath, I, I started thinking of my experiences in Israel. And suddenly I, I just decided, I found Shimon on Facebook. I reached out to him and I said, Shimon, it's been eight years. And would you do us the honor of reading scripture today as we talk about Sabbath? And so he uh, is reading scripture from Israel and he will be reading it in Hebrew for us this morning. Hebrew. 
ונכח אדוני תמיד, והשביע בצחצחות נפשך, ועצמותיך יחליץ, והיית כגן רבה, וכמוצא מים אשר לא יכזבו מימיו. ובנוי ממך חרבות עולם, מוסדי דור ודור תקומם, וקורא לך גודר פרץ, משובב נתיבו לשבט. אם תשיב משבת רגליך, עשות חפציך ביום קודשי, וקראת לשבת עונג, לקדוש אדוני מכובד, וכיבדתו מעשות דרכיך. ממצור חפציך ודבר דבר, אז תתענג על אדוני, ורכבתיך על במותי, ארץ ואיכתיך נחלת יעקב אביך, כי פי אדוני דיבר. Here, what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Uh, today is a Friday, and we are blessing Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, uh, this is the blessing for Friday evening. Shabbat is about to come. So, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Bye-bye.
So we're, we're, we're excited to hear this morning from Rabbi Philip. And Rabbi Philip, not to be confused with Reverend Philip, <laughs> uh, Rabbi Philip is from Harel, um, which is the synagogue here in West Vancouver. Now, how did I, I get to be connected? Well, um, Glenn's, uh, Glenn's wife, Catherine, uh, came up to me once and said, one of my friends goes to the synagogue and we realized, well, there's both young faith leaders. You guys should go for coffee. <laughs> and so we went for, we went for coffee and I discovered in Rabbi Philip this, a man of tremendous depth. And he, uh, he grew up in Georgia, did some of his theological studies in New York and, uh, has been here in West Vancouver for a few years now. And, um, so today, you know, why, why are we talking about Sabbath? That was one of the questions as Katie and I were preparing for this, this service today, was well, why, why are we talking about Sabbath? And um, is Sabbath really a basic that we should be going back to? And um, it occurred to me, so Sabbath is actually one of the Ten Commandments found in the Hebrew Scriptures, and I think we forget that. It's held in as high esteem as don't kill, right? So there's don't kill is one of the commandments and keep the Sabbath holy is another commandment. And so given that I am not the best at all with Sabbath, I try to take a day of rest, but the moment something comes up, it's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll check. I'm looking for excuses to check my email. And um, I, I, I compared it with Katie. I said, you know, imagine that you're, you're wanting to get back into tennis. Well, today in, in Rabbi Gibbs, we have what is, I think, a, a pro tennis player. So as, uh, Katie kind of joked that he was the, the Serena Williams <laughs> of the Sabbath. And so I really hope that, um, that in Sabbath that you will discover in this conversation um, I hope that you'll discover something that moves you beyond Sabbath as a set of rules and that you can get into Sabbath as a rhythm that is life-giving. The scripture passage that Rabbi Gibbs chose, the Isaiah passage, talks about this, this posture that if you, if you hold the Sabbath and if you keep the Sabbath holy, um, that God will move in goodness and faithfulness in, in not just your life, but all that you do. And so, um, yeah, I think, I, so I hope that helps you understand a little bit of what we're talking. And the way that we've done this this morning is we've separated, uh, we asked Rabbi Gibbs three different questions. And so we'll watch uh, part one is about seven minutes, and then Katie and I will be back just for a few, uh, a few moments, and then we'll do explore part two and then part three. Yeah, so this first part um, is just what is Sabbath all about? And it turns out it's not a self-care bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Sabbath? Um, I encourage you to pay attention to really the sense of freedom that Rabbi Philip expresses in observing the Sabbath. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Reverend Sir for inviting me uh, to share this teaching and this message with you, um, as well as accommodating uh, the fact that I'm currently in quarantine uh, following an emergency trip uh, to the States. And so with the Sabbath, uh, when we first hear about it in the Bible, uh, it comes at the end of the narrative of creation, uh, that after the six days of God creating the heaven and the earth, we read how God rests on the seventh day and declares that day to be holy. And so first, uh, to celebrate and to observe the Sabbath is to tap into uh, the natural sense of creation around us. Uh, but the actual command and current practice of it uh, comes from different sources. Uh, that, of course, the command to observe the Sabbath appears in the Ten Commandments. That, that first, in the book of Exodus, uh, when we read about the Israelites standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, uh, we hear the way that the Sabbath is that reenacting of creation. Uh, that each week uh, we remember how God rested and tap into that sense of reflection and celebration of all we accomplished during the past week. Uh, but in a slightly different language, uh, we read in Deuteronomy, 
as Moses tells the Israelites about their experience, he retells the Ten Commandments, and there connects the Sabbath with uh, the experience of the Israelites going forth in freedom from slavery in Egypt. Uh, that the command of observing the Sabbath is being able to own our own time and to be able to rest from our labor, as well as ensuring that the members of our household, of our community, even our work animals, are able to equally experience a day of rest. And so then in a few other places, we begin to have uh, more shaping of what it means to have these two emotions of, cre of celebrating creation and celebrating freedom and the very specific practices that have become at least the, the Jewish way of observing the Sabbath. Uh, that, you know, there's a few narratives, a few uh, prophetic injunctions uh, talking about how the Sabbath was not a day to conduct business, uh, that it was not a day to engage in certain household tasks. And so, as you watch the development of the Sabbath, you're able to see a few uh, main ideas come forward. Uh, that one of the first is that, uh, at least in the very strict Jewish, traditional Jewish experience of the Sabbath, that it's a day where everything is supposed to be prepared beforehand. Uh, and having it be a day where we're not supposed to engage in certain types of labor, it means that we're supposed to have you know, our laundry done and completed, uh, we're supposed to have our food prepared for the next day. Uh, and then one of the rituals uh, in Judaism of entering the Sabbath is lighting candles uh, to ensure that a household has its light uh, for the dark evening uh, of the weekly holiday. And so that one of the other sorts of emotions uh, and aesthetics is the way that in making it a special day, uh, that you are supposed to take you know, certain effort to make it special. Uh, that you have ancient rabbinic stories about how people uh, would bring myrtle branches into their home to ensure that there was a good smell. Uh, there was a description of how people would go out of their way to ensure that they had nicer bread for the holiday, as well as perhaps uh, making an extra effort to have a tastier meal, as well as seeing the sense of clo your clothing choices. We're supposed to be celebratory, but at the same time, for many of these ideas, uh, that it's supposed to be in a way that feels relaxed, uh, that you're not supposed to wear your, the sort of fancy uh, clothing that may be more difficult to wear, that it's supposed to have that mix of being clearly special while still being comfortable. And then, of course, uh, one of the other emotions that we read about the Sabbath is that it is supposed to be a day of joy. Um, but this isn't the sort of exuberant joy uh, that comes from some sort of overt celebration um, but rather, it comes from a sense of contentment, of being able to really identify the community that you're part of, and being able to sit and celebrate together with a sense of comfort. And so when you then look at these specific values, as well as the practices uh, that uh, Jews throughout the ages uh, have really uh, focused on in order to celebrate them, in some ways, on the one hand, you see uh, a grand project in social engineering of seeing the ways that uh, these values have really continued throughout the many different practices, as well as a few strange ironies. Um, that, of course, in having the very specific senses of what does and does not constitute that forbidden labor, you know, that some of them, like avoiding writing, meaning that we then uh, avoid you know, certain types of technology, are able to create a sense of relaxation of shifting our focus from the things that are happening around the world to uh, our immediate family and those who are physically closest to us. Um, but at the same time, you know, even as many things have become easier, uh, even as you know, certain parts of what it means to live conveniently in the world, we're able to see how extending this into some of those uh, prohibitions really create this weird sense of irony. Uh, that Reverend Nasir mentioned that when he was in Israel, uh, he saw that in uh, very observant areas uh, that there would be, you know, special Sabbath elevators, you know, that would automatically run uh, because many Jews would not use electricity on the Sabbath, seeing it connected to certain traditional prohibitions, and so that these elevators, uh, in a huge uh, waste of energy, would run all day, stopping at each floor, so that observant Jews would be able to get to their floor without having to take the energy of walking upstairs. 
And so, of course, uh, for Jews who follow that tradition, you know, to find themselves in a building that doesn't necessarily uh, have that Sabbath elevator, you know, becomes this choice of, you know, are they going to follow a specific interpretation that says pushing an elevator button is more work than walking up 10 flights of stairs? And so, of course, you know, many rabbis, in balancing that sense of work, recognize that uh, the riding the elevator uh, may not necessarily go against uh, that sense of uh, Shabbat labor, but something like using your cell phone, using your computer, in some ways of uh, you know, having those activities that shift your focus away from your immediate surroundings uh, and to the sort of stress of thinking about the wider world, still then goes against the spirit, uh, the spirit of Shabbat. Do you remember that, Katie, in, in Israel? Yeah, so, you know, when we got to Israel on, on starting on the Friday night, um, in the hotel we stayed in, there, there was this, this elevator, and we walked in, and none of the buttons worked on Friday night, because the elevator, the door would just open automatically, and you couldn't do anything to close it or keep it open, and it would just suddenly close, and then it would go up one floor, and the door would open, and then it would stay open for a while, and then the door would close, and this was to ensure that, it, that observant Jews wouldn't have to use electricity on that day. So I was fortunate because my room was on the fourth floor, which meant only four times doing this. But some of the people on our bus, I remember, were on the eighth and ninth floor of the hotel. So, you know, when you forgot something that became a really long journey to go up, go down, go up again. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, I don't know if your mic is on, Kate, but um, while you turn that on, um, I think what really stands out to me about Sabbath and, and the way that uh, Rabbi Gibbs talks about it is he, he starts to shift it away from rules, right? In this first video, he talks about, I think what stands out to me is, is the sense of how special it is, but also how relaxed it is. Um, I thought, well, you know, since today is our Sabbath, I should be wearing my jogging pants. <laughs> but I love that sense, right, of, of really making it a special day. And the sense of joy and the freedom that this gets to be a special day in the week. Like even this morning, because I watched the video last night, I was thinking about what shirt I should wear that would feel special but relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I, yeah, that. I, I, I love also how he ties in, the, like the word emotion mm. a lot was never something I, I really connected with Sabbath. I know uh, one of my professors uh, is, really takes his Sabbath very seriously as a Christian, and he, uh, for him and his family, it's, it's Wednesdays, and so they've decided it's Wednesdays, they would just turn all cell phones off, turn all technology off, and from his Jewish, uh, his Jewish colleagues, he learned that every morning at the start of Sabbath, he would place a drop of honey on his son's tongue because he wanted for the rest of his life uh, for his son to associate Sabbath with sweetness. I love that. So, um, Kitty, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, part two? Sure, number two. Uh, we asked Rabbi Philip to tell us a bit about why and how he uh, really got into observing Sabbath so that we can learn something of his experience. So while I grew up in a very actively Jewish home, I grew up in a denomination of Judaism uh, that did not follow all of the traditional restrictions. And so it wasn't until I went to college uh, that I then started to really get to know uh, Jews who were more traditionally observant. And I went from you know, being someone who enjoyed uh, having and you know, going to uh, Friday night services into someone who then took on those traditional prohibitions of not cooking, of not writing, of avoiding technology uh, on the Sabbath. And in so many ways, it would not have been possible to do so if I had not been embedded in a community that was able to facilitate it. You know, that in choosing to be Sabbath observant, uh, I became part of a group of students uh, who really were able to dedicate that day into communal meals, into communal study, communal singing, uh, communal prayer. And then in doing so, I was able to really connect and build friendships uh, many of which 
continue to be the strongest friendships in my life today. And so really, for me, uh, the rhythm that came into being able to organize my life around turning my phone off for, for a day, uh, around you know, preparing uh, the meals beforehand for the Sabbath, as well as being able to plan uh, each week uh, so that in following these very strict rules, it was able to be part of community depended on being surrounded by others who were doing the same. And so, of course, uh, between being in college, between living uh, in New York during my seminary studies, uh, that I was in communities where keeping these traditional rules of the Sabbath felt incredibly natural. Uh, that in one of the conversations that I feel like I often have uh, with someone, for instance, like my father, you know, who is not traditionally Sabbath observant, is not particularly religious, uh, comes from having that tension and understanding how really the choice of being Sabbath observant uh, is going to influence the choice of where you live. You know, are you in a community that has the critical mass of people who are able to follow these traditions also? Uh, are you in a city with synagogues that understand that? Uh, that you know, even though he didn't make those choices, and when I go to visit my family, you know, in some ways uh, the Sabbath becomes a day that I really stay at home instead of participating in Jewish community, uh, that it becomes the, uh, the proof that what it really means to live a Sabbath observant life ultimately does depend on the community you live in. And so, uh, but that's still what it means to be traditionally Sabbath observant, where uh, in talking to people who are less traditional than I am, you know, which includes uh, really all of my congregants, you know, that even if they aren't as strict as I am in following the specific rules of what you do and do not do on the Sabbath, that they're still able to tap into some of the values uh, that came from uh, the history and the development of those traditional rules. And so, of course, as a community leader, you know, I'm choosing to live in a community that doesn't necessarily have uh, that infrastructure of observance. Um, but in doing so, I'm here to serve my community, and I'm here to really share what those values are, to be able to give them a taste of that experience, and wherever possible, encourage them to do more, uh, but understanding how perhaps West Vancouver isn't the most natural place uh, to have uh, that serious, traditional, uh, Shabbat-observant community, yet it is still able to be a place that we're able to I have the taste of what it means to celebrate uh, the Sabbath, uh, as well as learning from the Jewish tradition. I think what strikes me the most about that segment is the way that he talks about Sabbath in terms of community. Because since it's one of the Ten Commandments, I internalized it as something that I need to do. But I love that he talks about it in terms of uh, a greater group of people. And it makes me think about maybe the ways that we can lift each other up in upholding Sabbath together and hold each other accountable to really um, enjoy what Sabbath can be. Yeah. Uh, so on, on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, Linda, who came in to do the PowerPoint this week, came in and, and she was really intrigued about this, this whole conversation about Sabbath. And she was telling me about... Her, uh, her Jewish friends and, and how they, they just seem to have this, this lifestyle, right? That, that their faith uh, is all of who they are. And as she was talking, a, a small part of me realized, right, how I think we've made Christianity, in a sense, um, so easy, right? And, 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 and that not all of us would describe Christianity as, as a lifestyle. Right? And, and, but originally, God's plan for God's people was to have a people who were set apart. Um, I remember asking Shimon, our tour guide, you know, about all of these things in Israel that were really amazing. I said, wow, how did you guys come up with this and that? And he, he looked at me and said, well, Simon, young Simon, we are God's chosen. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, in this final part, part three, we asked uh, Rabbi Philip to talk about, um, to give us tips. Well, what, what could it look like for us as Christians to start to re-engage with a practice that um, I think the way it was practiced was probably a good thing to move away from when it does become just 
just rule-based. Um, but my question to him was, we're not all Jewish rabbis. <laughs> and so um, for those of us who aren't Jewish rabbis, do you have tips for us as to how we can start engaging with Sabbath? So there's been a number of contemporary attempts of trying to bring the spirit of the Sabbath uh, to really respond to some of our current communal ills. Uh, that, of course, there is this widespread addiction to technology uh, that I'm sure, especially over the past few weeks, uh, it's been incredibly easy to completely bury our noses and our computers and our phones as we just constantly read this sort of stream of news that doesn't necessarily take us anywhere new. And so uh, there is this attempt of using uh, the idea of Sabbath, of using the idea of you know, a day without technology as the chance to reset and hopefully to stop that addiction. Uh, and so I can say, as someone who does turn my phone off uh, for a full day every week, you know, it doesn't necessarily change my relationship to the phone uh, during the other six days of the week, you know, but that it is possible to be able to shift your focus uh, from a constant stream of notifications into our more immediate surroundings. And then, uh, in a related note, uh, that in using the Sabbath as that chance to focus on those around us, uh, that it becomes, in some ways, uh, an opportunity to really name and celebrate our closest community. Uh, that I had one student, you know, for whom their Friday night routine would be that they would take uh, all of their cell phones and put them in a basket and play board games together. You know, I actually had one of uh, his children uh, ask if they would be able to have a Shabbat night, you know, a Sabbath night, you know, on a random Wednesday, really just looking for that chance to uh, connect and to be able to spend that quality family time together. And so one of the other questions then becomes, you know, what does it mean to you know, recognize uh, what exactly the Sabbath means to different communities? Uh, that, of course, you know, many of the strictures and rules, you know, really develop out of the specific Jewish sense of what it meant to mix discipline and ritual and having that deeper theology of the way that our actions are able to facilitate a connection to God. And so, you know, as someone who really has learned a lot less about Christianity, you know, I'm really not exactly sure of what the Sabbath has meant uh, in Christian circles. Uh, that, you know, sometimes it, it is the, the attempt of, you know, putting those rules on, even in the wider communities that do not follow it. Uh, that, you know, in the development of the Jewish experience of the Sabbath, you know, that often it was done either uh, within the rural communities uh, of the ancient world uh, or, you know, as the recognition, you know, that Jews were able to be the small enclave within a wider society, you know, whether it was within Christian Europe uh, or in, you know, the countries of the, the Middle East and Asia, you know, which were uh, controlled uh, by the Muslim empires. And so, even as uh, many of the traditional rules of the Sabbath, you know, really are part of a particular Jewish lifestyle, um, I do think that there is that wisdom uh, in trying to reset a relationship with technology of needing uh, rituals and settings in order to make sure that we do connect with those around us, uh, as well as being able to appreciate all the work uh, that goes into many of the things we enjoy uh, day to day and week to week that there is a lot of wisdom uh, in the traditional observance of the Sabbath, um, but without that infrastructure of the observant Jewish community, uh, of others who are united in that goal of creating the specific aesthetics uh, of Sabbath observance, um, that is much more of that attempt of learning from and appreciating its history, as well as adapting some of the practices uh, into our contemporary life. And so I know that you know, my life has been greatly enriched uh, by many of the, the practices of Jewish observance. Um, and it's meant that I've been able to be embedded within uh, you know, the strong 
Arab Jewish communities. Um, but it's something that really does come from that community practice more so than any individual choice. And so I hope you know, that by, by sharing and, and teaching you today, they were able to gain a sense of that appreciation as well as being able to find perhaps uh, that small tidbit you know, of what it means to be able to experience your Sabbath uh, in a different way, and hopefully in a way that's able to bring you closer uh, to your community, as well as your own personal understanding of how you want to exist in the world. And so again, thank you so much for letting me share with you this morning. And of course, if you have any other, other questions, uh, you, know, you can uh, contact me uh, at the synagogue, um, which I believe uh, Reverend Masura will be able to, to give you that information. So thank you. to uh, Rabbi Philip for, uh, for just, I don't know, stirring up a lot within me. Um, I'd love to, what was one of your takeaways, Katie? Yeah, I think what I'm left thinking about that I'm going to be thinking about throughout the week is um, it stood out to me that he talked about the sense of freedom and he said something about how Sabbath is really all about connection mm -hmm. and so that I'm going to think about what are the things that I can do in my life that it might seem like a bit of work at first or um, setting some boundaries so that 
me and the people in my community can experience um, what are God's greatest gifts to us, which probably is not my cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very valid point. Um, my, my hope is that for all of you, as we face these renewed uh, restrictions on our social gatherings, that as you find yourself experiencing um, a, a kind of silence that feels a little bit imposed on you, um, that you would be able to start shifting that imposition um, towards intention, intentionality. Um, that I think in using what Rabbi Gibbs talked about, that this time of, of restricted movement and gathering could become a place in your life where that silence becomes life-giving and filled with the goodness and holiness of God. Um, I know I'll be making an effort to be more intentional with my family. That's a piece that I know I'm, I'm not always really good at. Um, I know often Evie will be in the middle of telling me a story and my phone will buzz and I find myself checking my phone and she looks at me and says, um, <laughs> I was telling you a story. And so may we use, um, may we enter into the sense of Sabbath and discover a, a, a way of being more present to God and to those around us. And so, friends, as you do that, may you know that you are loved, may you know that you matter, and may you know that you are not alone. And I pray for God's blessing and God's love over you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.